Praise the Lord. Um, it's, it's good to see everyone tonight. Um, I, I want to say that um, if I'd like all everyone to stay in here tonight, if um, if the kids have to go back, say the kids are getting unsettled, that's fine. And you feel you have to go back or you have to breastfeed or something. Iron. Um, you, <laughs> well, you're nodding your head like... They're already unsettled. Okay. Um, guys, I would just like everyone to stay in tonight. This is probably uh, one of the most important things I've ever shared as a pastor, if not the most important. So, um, so I would just... Um, Obviously, if a child gets so unsettled, they're maybe bothering you and, and everyone else. I mean, that's fine. Um, the other thing is, um, yeah, I think there's a couple of people nearly here. So I, I think um, I just want to respect that. If so, if there people are going to be here in like two minutes, I would rather wait on them. I want to say tonight that everything that I'm going to share tonight was confirmed this morning by the Lord to me whenever I woke up. The scripture text that I was given absolutely put meat on the bones on everything I was going to say. And probably you're like me. Whenever you're reading through the Word of God, you're, you're so stuck in the passage, you're not really sure what the next chapter is or the next psalm is. So for me, I'm not even thinking about it. I'm knowing that uh, we're going to fast and pray today, and I know that what I'm going to share is pretty potent. But um, equally, I want to know that I know that I know that I'm right on track, that I'm not off here, I'm not off here. So... Um, <coughs> I've also, um, say even today, I've been talking to Pastor Tim and Davey. Um, one thing that is really good whenever you're in a battle is to have people around you that are the real McCoy when it comes to spiritual warfare. Um, I can tell you over the years, um, I've been privileged to know a lot of quality men and women of God. I know, by the way, women of God, that their whole life was just prayer. And one of them was my mom's friend, June. And that was her life. She just prayed, prayed, prayed. Um, and she passed away about two years ago. And do you know what? I remember talking to her about four years ago and she says, Paul, do you know I pray for you every day? I pray for the church. I pray for the... the it's kind of weird tonight what I'm going to share to you. It kind of started about two years ago. <laughs> so, no, but she was the real McCoy prayer warrior. She didn't have a job. She just... Her, her job was intercession. She would come to our house, and honestly, you would just see June halfway down the field with a blanket around her, just praying for like 10, 14 hours. Um, so I'm just glad over the years I've known people like that, but I, I'm just saying that what I'm going to share with you tonight, I believe, is confirmed. I bounced it off pastors. I've bounced, not, not everything I'm going to say, but over this last two years, I've just bounced stuff off pastors just to make sure that I'm not going away off here. I'm not going away off here. Um, but um, tonight I would like us just to turn in our Bibles to Psalm 83, 1. So this is where my reading was this morning. So I'm going to use that as a basis this, mo this evening uh, to what I'm going to say. Okay, um, I'm going to put it up on the overhead if anybody. Um, Ron, are you able to read this for me tonight? Okay, so where's the, where's the mic? There you go, thanks. Keep not thou silence, O God. Hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people, and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, Come, and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. Who said, let us take to ourselves the house of God in possession? 
Oh my God, make them like a wheel, as the stubble before the wind, as the fire burneth a wood, and as the flames setteth the mountains on fire. So persecute them with thy tempest, and make them afraid with thy storm. Fill their faces with shame, that they may seek thy name, O Lord. Let them be confounded and troubled forever. Yea, let them be put to shame and perish, that men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, art the most high over all the earth. Amen. Let's, let's pray tonight. Lord, we first of all want to acknowledge tonight that you are a sovereign God. Lord, that you are in control. Lord, that you love your people and your people love you. But Lord, we also acknowledge as your people that we live in a war zone. We live in enemy territory tonight. Lord, this world is not our home, O oh God. Lord, we're passing through. We have a few days here and then we're out of here. And Lord, we just want your help as we try to discern what is going on around us. Lord, what is happening, what um, we have to do, where we are going, where we need, what we need to know tonight. I pray that your name will be exalted, O oh God, in this service. In Jesus' mighty name we pray it. Amen. Amen. Any of you that are truly spiritually discerning will know that the devil loves darkness. Amen? He doesn't like the light. Whenever I shared on Sunday, like I, all I can say is for over two years, I've felt the most incredible, incredible press and darkness coming against me. I've shared it with you guys. I've tried not to freak people out. So I've tried to talk very little about it because sometimes if you talk too much about it, maybe people start to get paranoid or it starts to come upon them. So I didn't want that to happen. And up until now, I haven't really had liberty to share to the congregation what I feel is coming against this church. Um, I've shared with a few key men of God right from the very start. Um, I was driving along in a car back 20, 27 months ago. Everything in the church seemed fine. Everything at home seemed fine. Just everything was going good. And there was such a dark, demonic oppression come upon me that I've never felt before. And I've shared it in little bitty bits to you, but I don't know whether you remember me saying that it felt like I was going through the worst bereavement that I've ever experienced and the worst betrayal that I've ever experienced. Have any of you heard me saying that? But there was nothing, there was not, there was nothing that would give any indication what was going on or why I was feeling what I was feeling. Um, but when I shared on Sunday that we were going to do this, Guess what happened? The whole thing started to lift. That oppression, I would say that it's lifted like 95%. Do you know what that tells me? The devil doesn't like the light. The devil doesn't like it when you bring things out onto the table, out into the open, out of secret, out of the, the darkness, you bring stuff into the light, the devil starts to get scared. Now, I want you to know tonight that our enemy tonight is the devil. Amen. Okay? We do not re wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. Um, God works in the light. And guys, there's a lesson in there for us. I'm telling you, the more transparent you are as a Christian, the better. Amen? Amen. The more open you are, the more that... The Bible says, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. If I, if I say to Jesse, hey, brother, you're looking good today. I better not go to Curtis and say, look at the state of Jesse. Do you see? Hey, do you know what I'm talking about, guys? Huh? In Ireland, there, there is a, a joke, okay? But, but it's a very profound joke. When in Ireland does a, a Catholic change from being a Catholic to being... The derogatory term for a Catholic is Fenian in Ireland. Okay? It's, now, it's really it's an old ancient Irish warrior, but they, it's a derogatory term. Okay? So when do they change from being a Catholic to being a Fenian? When they leave the room. Do 
you understand? Do you know what I'm getting at? But that, is that the way Christians are? You know, what I'm saying is we should always be who we are. What you get of me is what you get. Whether you like it or not, and vice versa, what I get with you. Now, granted, we cut the rough edges off each other. Amen? So none of us have arrived and will not arrive until we see him face to face. Here's a scripture, and I'm telling you, for somebody who studied secret societies for years, here's a very powerful scripture for you tonight. In your Christian walk, in your marriage, in your family, in your church life. Um, Ron, would you read this again, please? Mark 4, 22. For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested. Neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come abroad. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. Okay. So you guys are like me tonight, okay? You read the Word of God. At least I hope you read the Word of God. Amen? Tell me this. When it comes to right and wrong, is the Scriptures ambiguous or are they clear? I mean, is everything in the Scripture so vague and so gray that it's so hard to discern when it comes to truth, whether this is truth or whether that is truth? For anybody that knows the book, would you agree they should be able to discern between right and wrong? Amen? Okay. The Bible is very clear on God's heart and the behavior He expects from His children. The Bible is also very clear on Satan's aims and what his influence produces. Okay, Ron, would you read these two verses tonight? Just, just leave it on, you're okay. <laughs> Psalms 133, 1-3. Addresses this. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. And all God's people said? Amen. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 25, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. What is God's view of division? What's God's view of unity? Okay. Okay, so be under no illusion tonight. You and me, this church, have come to the devil's attention. Is that a shock to you? In fact, we've come to the devil's attention a long time ago. Yeah. He is not happy with us. And he has set himself against us. Satan's desire is to take us down. The devil's des desire is to destroy you, me, your family, this church. He wants to close the doors. Who agrees with that? Amen. Twenty-seven months ago, I felt either a demon or demons coming against me, and I knew what their intent was to destroy. Destroy everything in its path. But I was aware that, and it's one thing that why pastors carry a lot of stuff is because ultimately they know that de the pastor's going to be the target that they want to take out first, Okay. That shouldn't surprise you, okay? I'm going to give you scripture to prove that. Um, I knew the devil wanted to destroy me, wanted to destroy my marriage, wanted to destroy my family, wanted to destroy this church. But I felt that, well, you know what? I'm just going to get into spiritual warfare here. But the things that normally has worked over the years for me, like fasting and prayer, worship, praise, giving God thanks, uh, interceding in tongues, just talking in the Spirit, just fighting through, resisting the devil and he will flee. None of that would work. Of course, you, what you do is you examine your own heart. Lord, is there something in me that is, um, that is holding back the blessing or the breakthrough? 
Um, the, what was coming against me was very dark and very dominant and very belligerent. And its aim to me was to divide and destroy. I'm going to be honest, I've never encountered anything as dark, anything as determined, or anything as strong in my life. And I want to say to you as a police officer, I've been in a few dark situations and felt demonic presences. I've been in places where I knew the terrorists were actually about to kill me and my colleagues. Okay? I've written books on secret societies. I've felt that demonic resistance. When I've come to the reservation at the start, I felt like every demon on the reservation come into my bedroom that first night. There was such an oppression. Like it was like, it was nearly tangible. I've been through the battles with the new build, with the potential building and conflict with the village, with the tribe. I've been in a lot of battles, but nothing like this battle. Nothing like this resistance that I've experienced over this last number of months. Please be aware that the devil is a tactician. He plans his attacks. Would you agree? Do you think he just attacks you willy-nilly? Huh? Um, he waits his moment, even if that takes years. By the way, I talked to Pastor Terry down in Omaha, and he quoted uh, Pastor Simbala, or not Simbala. Who's the pastor in uh, New York? No, Jim, what? Simbal, okay. Okay, and he said, uh, Pastor Terry used to go to that church. He said, the devil will wait years to get his moment and then hit, hit you, hit me, hit us. He's a tactician, he's a strategist. He's got you profiled. He's got us profiled. Um, he waits his moment, even if that takes years. He's been watching this church for years Identify, identifying who he can work in and through. Basically, Satan knows how to target an assembly, when to target an assembly, and who to target in an assembly. Okay. Okay. He knows the authority in a church. He knows the leadership in a church. He knows everybody who comes through those doors. He knows whether you're genuine or not. He knows whether you're a real prayer warrior or whether you're just someone who looks on prayer just as some type of little religious duty. Would you agree that he knows what's in this church? He probably also knows the call of God on us. Do you know one thing that's always kind of, not troubled me, but always kind of mesmerized me in Scripture is, how did the devil know Moses, that little baby, in swaddling clothes. How did he know that Moses was Israel's deliverer? Do you ever wonder that? Why did he pick on Moses? How did he even know about Jesus back 2,000 years ago? He, he, let me tell you, the devil knows more than we probably realize. And he, he knows the scriptures. He knows that the scriptures are God's truth. He knew it was time for the Messiah to come. What did he do? How determined was he to wipe out Jesus? What lengths did he go to? What did he, what did he end up doing to, to wipe out the baby Jesus? Every baby younger than two years of age, he wiped them all out. Why? It's not incredible. Like sometimes we read that and we, I don't know, I don't think we even realize that was a genocide. That was a genocide. Who was behind that genocide? Who was Herod controlled by? <coughs> now think about this. The devil, whenever he hits, he typically tries to use broken or hurting people or people that refuse to heal or those who have an issue with authority. I'm talking in church life. I talk to pastors all the time. The pastor that was here on Sunday, you mightn't realize it, but basically he was threw out of his church a month ago. Pastor John is a godly man. His wife is a godly woman. They're just authentic, genuine, 
believers. Who felt that? Or who, who has felt that even getting to know them? They're the real McCoy. Okay? What happened was there was a witch who was related to a woman in the church. Sister. And obviously they were praying for his destruction. The, the sister then started to, over this last couple of years to work against him and his wife. Then the husband aligned himself with the whole thing. They brought it to the board, put his head on a plate, boom, bye-bye. See ya. That couple and their little baby are out of a job. I'm telling you, that story I'm hearing it time after time after time. Not just here, but throughout the world. There is a resistance coming up from within the church today. There is a rebellion coming up within the church today. But the devil can't hit anybody. There has to be vulnerabilities in your character for him to destroy you or to destroy us. I'm not saying that he can't hurt us. He can. I'm not saying that he can't do real damage. He can. But I'm telling you something that we're in a real war. We're in a real battle. And I'm telling you, this is real. Um, significantly, and I'm telling you, I'm, I, when you bounce things off pastors, you start to realize they're dealing with the same thing. Like, there's nothing new under the sun. What we're dealing with is no different from what is rising up over this last couple of years. Especially since COVID. Now, I want you to listen to me carefully here so that you get perspective. If you have ever listened to the testimony or the story of witches, okay, and I'm not saying that anyone in this church is a witch, okay, so please, please hear me. No, seriously, please hear me. But I'm just going to say something. If you've ever talked to witches, if you've ever listened to their story of how they ended up being a witch, one thing that you'll find with their story is that they were broken, embittered people that have ended up desiring revenge. Take my word for that. I'm not recommending any of you go online to YouTube tonight and go and start listening to stories of witches. So please, please let, let me see if you doing that. But take, take it from me, having talked to them or having talked to pastors who deal with them, especially in Haiti. Um, pastors, there's things pastors won't do in Haiti. One thing they will not do in Haiti is cast a demon out of a demon-possessed person unless they plead for it. Do you know why? They have cast demons out of people in Haiti and they didn't really want to be free. And what happened was they ended up being seven times worse. So they weren't helping the person. They were actually helping destroy the person. So they have a protocol among the pastors. And I'm telling you, there's things that got, you just learn on the job. But what I'm saying is pastors have to deal with real demons. They deal with people who are demon-possessed. Like, I have a demons say a lot of things to me, like how they're going to destroy me. And I'm like, no, you're going to be destroyed. You're going to be destroyed by the Lord someday. If a demon ever talks to you, talk straight back to it. <coughs> okay? Seriously, do you, who believes demons are real? Who believes people are still possessed by demons today? See, what happens today, we so heavily medicate them that we think, oh, isn't Jimmy fine? He's just got a little bit of a quirk in him. Look, he acts a bit odd. No, he's demon-possessed. And they've medicated them to such a stage he's just a zombie. Seriously. We're living in a demon-possessed world today. It might shock us out there who's demon-possessed. I am of the opinion that there is people praying against this church. I... They're either, I believe there's either a coven of witches praying against us or there is a spiritual group on this reservation that, are, are, that have supernatural powers that are praying against us. Okay? I believe that. And Jesse knows I, I was probably acting weird when we went to court the other day. But I'm telling you what, there was people in that court. The court was empty. There was one case. Amen? One case. Did, did anybody else have any right, like, any interest in being there apart from us and the judge? And the, 
But there was four or five women sitting in that back row, sitting there smugly and snugly, sitting in the back row like this here. I'm just telling you guys, and you can say I'm being paranoid or whatever, but I'm telling you what, we are in a war. Yeah. There is no doubt that we are, we are on the receiving end of a lot of dark stuff that has come in our direction. Yeah. I'm just telling you as a pastor, because do you know what? For me to keep silent, then I would be feeling God and I would be giving the devil house room. When you are under attack, when you are the, whenever you are the recipient of being under attack, then you need to know about it before you confront it and overcome it. And by the way, I'm going to come to the good stuff. Okay, so just bear with me, okay? So, what is coming against our church is ruthless. It's, I don't believe we're dealing with a Mickey Mouse demon here. I believe we're dealing with principalities. Like, maybe territorial stuff. Uh, you know the story of Daniel. Daniel wasn't dealing with a Mickey Mouse demon. Like, honestly, the devil will hit you with the Mickey Mouse demons whenever you're just born again. Okay? Just all the, but the longer you start to grow, and the more a church starts to grow, you start to deal with stronger powers. Str powers that are scared. And I'm telling you, there's principalities and powers in this area that are scared. I was approached about nine and a half years ago by two members of the Omaha Reservation. One was a police officer, one was an elder. Within one week, this is when everything seemed to be going fine for us. And they says, Paul, be careful. I says, both of them said the same thing. They didn't, I don't even know whether they knew each other. The police officer says, Paul, be careful. I'm telling you, the tribe's not happy with you. I says, why are they not happy with me? They says, you're getting too much influence. This church is getting too much influence. They're not happy. A few days later, a woman comes to me, one of the elders in the tribe, and says, be careful. I says, why? He says, the tribe's not happy with you. I says, why? They said, they're scared of you. You're getting too much influence. And I took that, at that time, everything's going smooth in here. Like, it's like, oh, praise the Lord. Everybody loves us. Isn't this lovely? Within six months, they started to trash my name and the name of this church. There started to be a whole campaign. There was actually a campaign, a petition that was sent around the reservation to get Jen, me, and the kids thrown off the reservation. They had to get 3,000 signatures to make that happen. It's in the Omaha Nation law. Thankfully, they couldn't even, they, they could hardly... They tried, but they, they got very little, whatever it was. They had, somebody told me when they went into the, the tribal building and there's the petition sitting there for people to sign. So I knew right away that there's a war on, okay? Um, I knew that my cup of iniquity was full one week whenever I was accused of being the devil and antichrist in the one week. Yeah. within seven days and all I could think is my cup is finally full like what more can they say about you you're the devil and you're antichrist so well little do they know like antichrist and the devil are two different entities but okay but I'm just letting you know that a lot of that I just laughed at honestly it's like honestly whenever the world's doing that really they can do whatever they want but you know what they've no power over me or any power over you okay in this reading that we looked at, have a look at verse 4 and verse 12. What is the aim of the enemy? Les, tell me, have a look at that. What is the aim? What does the enemy want to do to the people of God? Oh, sorry. There's something in 4 and there's something in 12. They want to divide, shut it from growing. Well, what, it, what does it mean if they, they want to have no more remembrance? Of, oh, to be dead. Like, be gone. <laughs> what, what, what is the agenda here of the enemy? What's the next thing? Have a look at verse 12. What's the agenda here? They want to take possession of what we have. Tell me this. Do you think that as we build this building, do you think that um, anybody would want to take that building off us? And use it? For their purposes? 
Sila. Think about it. Guys, this was my reading this morning, by the way. This was my reading this morning. In His providence, God knew that we were going to be here tonight, and He gives me this reading that covers all the bases, by the way. Okay. Please remember, when the enemy hits this church, he wants to hit me first. Okay? He wants to destroy the shepherd and then divide the sheep. Now, think about this. Uh, Ron, would you just read this? Yeah, just a verse. Sorry. Zechariah 13, 7 tells us, Strike the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. Guys, that's the word of God. I'm not here to look anybody's sympathy or any pity. I don't really, I don't need anybody's sympathy or pity. I'm here to tell you a biblical truth. The devil will always aim for the leader. He's always done it in history. He's always done it in the Word of God. Talk to any pastor. Who does the devil want to target first? Why do you think, Bill, he would want to take the pastor out first? See, the devil knows that God has, God has visionaries. He's got leaders. There's authority. Who knows that God's a God of authority? Who believes in authority? Authority in the home? Authority in the church, authority in society. Is, is that biblical or not? Okay. So the devil does not like authority. He's an anarchist. Okay. When you see all the anarchy happening in, where was it, Washington or whatever? What was the name of that city? Huh? Seattle. When you've seen all that chaos, get, guess who was behind all the chaos? Guys, when you see riots and chaos and all that stuff, I don't care whether it's conservatives or liberals, you can be sure the devil's behind it. Because God is an author of peace and order and structure. I'm telling you, I will never put my name to chaos or division or destruction. That's the enemy's work. These are, what I'm sharing with you tonight is very, the very basics of Christian living, of spiritual warfare. Would you agree? Is there anything we're saying that's not a, a very 101 basic about Christian living? Okay. Please note the devil is fully aware of the importance of authority and order. He knows how discipline works within the assembly. He knows how the church is structured. He knows what makes the church strong. And he's been at this for long enough. So... I've kind of covered that. Okay. The devil can't do whatever he wants. He needs, he basically needs an entry point. The devil can only get in and hurt us if we let him in. Does that make sense? Yeah. We have to let the devil in. He isn't welcome to come in. He's not welcome to come into your house. He's not welcome to come into this church. Somebody has to open the door and say, come on in. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Or else the devil's omnipotent. Is the devil in control? No. Does the devil call the shots? If the devil says no, is it no? If the devil says yes, is it yes? But if God says no, guess what? If God says yes, guess what? Okay, so I'm telling you tonight that our God is in control. That, that there is a protection on the people of God. I want us to listen real careful here. Even though we wrestle not against flesh and blood, spirits need humans to function through. Ron, would you read this scripture, please? 1 Timothy 4, 1. Now the Spirit, now the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, and doctrines of devils. Okay. So what this is saying is near the end, there are those who profess faith that will be attracted <coughs> to the message and agenda of Satan rather than the truth of God and his design for holy living. Now how could this be possible? The devil will convince those who are prepared to listen his lies 
that it is all about them, their feelings, their desires. Whereas the gospel, the truth, is all about him, his glory, and his will. Would you agree? If you find somebody that is so taken up by themselves, their feelings, they're always getting hurt or offended, whatever. Guess what? They're an easy target for the devil. The Bible says, they that basically fear God, I haven't got it in my notes, who fear God or love God, have great peace, and nothing by shall any means offend them. Okay? You look at the, the definition of agape love. I'm not saying we don't have our moments, guys, okay? But I'm talking about where somebody just chooses, that's who I am. I'm offended, and that's who I am. Okay? We all have our moments, okay? Would you agree? Who, who, who gets offended in here? We, we all have to put our hands up, okay? But I'm not talking about just taking an offense and then you're like, why am I, why am I even holding on to that? Like, and, and you feel convicted and it's like, God forgive me, okay? So I'm not talking about that. We, we all struggle with something or, at, at times. So I want to go a little bit deeper here. A major aim of this spirit is to get people captivated with the faults of others, which prevents them from seeing their own feelings. Consequently, they become hard and embittered. They will not take ownership of their own shortcomings before God, or humble themselves, or repent and reconcile with those they are bitter against. These people will be so consumed with their own personal hurts that they do not even see or care about the division and destruction they're causing. They either don't see it or they don't care. They are now wide open to receive this evil spirit's soothing message of victimhood. Oh, poor Jimmy. Oh, come to me. Nobody understands what you're going through. Now, I'm not saying that this here is something that's unique to us or it's recent. I've been dealing with this for 27 months, guys. And what I've noticed is a pattern. People who don't even know each other or I know aren't even talking, they're actually talking the same. And they're dealing with this attack the same way. Instead of the biblical way, if you've got an issue with a brother or sister, what's the biblical way to deal with it? And do what? If you're in the wrong, what do you have to do? If the other person's in the wrong, what do they need to do? And then what are you meant to do if it's resolved? Reconcile. And then what? Done. Okay. But for 27 months, I'm telling you as a pastor, it's like, it's getting to the stage where this is not normal, natural. This is demonic. People are under attack. Now, I don't believe a Christian can be demon-possessed. But I do believe they can be demonized. Basically, they can be the... the they can be the focus of demonic attack where they're, they're, they're under attack and then they start to, what you receive is what you believe is what you become. So the devil just has to whisper and they jump. I'm telling you, the devil has been doing this for a long, long time and he's pretty good at doing what he does. He knows how to oppress people. What I'm seeing is people, because they're vulnerable, they're wide open, they're, they're not forgiving, so they're leaving themselves wide up and the devil's just coming and going, wonderful, oh, another victim. Oh, oh, we really have a connection. Oh, I care for you. Pastor doesn't care for you, but I do. Les doesn't care for you, but I do. Jesse doesn't care for you, but I do. And I'm telling you what happens is, if you open your ear in any way, and you let the devil define who you are, that you're a victim, guess what? You already are wide open for attack. The devil loves that. I'm telling you, that's one of the number one. I've looked over this last couple of weeks, I've, I've looked at sites that I can really trust. And honestly, if you look at them, like ministries that are really switched on in regard to spiritual warfare, the number one thing that normally opens people up to this is... Being hurt and unforgiving. So what happens is, somebody gets hurt. They don't deal with it, then they become bitter. 
it, bitterness doesn't stay there, then they become resentful. And they don't stay there. If they're, then they become vengeful. And they start to, start to go down until they start to lose where they had control over their emotions. When they had control over their actions, it now has control over them. And if you said to them, why are you doing this? Why are you saying this? Why are you talking like this? I've heard people say, I've, I can't change. I have no control over this. And I'm like, you're right. I've heard that. And I'm like, when you start to hear, start to put the dots together and you start to get to the root of it, it's like, it's real easy to open a door to the enemy. Real easy. Now, I put here in the second paragraph, Satan loves victims. These are people that have not let God heal their hurts. With a victim, it's always someone else's fault and never theirs. He uses them like puppets. So Curtis used this the other day, and I've been thinking about it since. The devil's a puppet master. He just pulls the hand up, and they pull the hand up. The devil pulls the hand up, they pull the hand up. I'm sure you all know people like that, do you? That it takes very little. You could knock them over with your pinky. Do you? Anybody know anybody like that? Okay. You could knock them over with your pinky. You literally need to... There's some people I like walk like this, right? Because... I know even text message, I hate texting some of these people because if I put a little short reply, it's, it's going to be interpreted as being cold. If I put a long reply, it's going to be dissected. Seriously, it's like, what's he trying to say here? He's just trying to say something simple like, okay, guys, this is serious stuff. This is big stuff. The devil will make you paranoid. Like, the amount of times I hear people saying, well, something, Pastor Paul, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, what? I wasn't even thinking that. Or they're paranoid that, or if I call somebody to get paranoid, what's he going to put me right at about now? And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> or he's coming around to see me, what's he going to say now? And I'm like, Ugh. okay. No, but I'm, I'm not saying everybody. I'm saying occasionally I hear that, okay? Okay. Listen, please don't think that I'm saying everybody in our church is like that, because they're not. 98% of people are fine, okay? And even the 98% have their moments, just like I have my moments. The reason why I need you to be gracious with me is because I have to be gracious with you. It's only a matter of time before you're going to mess up. You are going to mess up. If I'm around Peter for 24 hours, I guarantee you I'm going to find something on him. We had a saying in the police. I'm telling you, there's, there's very few cars that are going to come along that road that there's not going to be something wrong with. So what we had, we said, like, so normally if somebody failed the attitude test, we're like, okay, if you want to be an ignoramus with me, I'll find something in your car that's wrong. <laughs> Now, thankfully, I didn't have to do that. Most of the, even, even the terrorists, I cannot, I normally, I'm just saying, if somebody really failed, failed the attitude test, would you agree, it would need to be a perfect car that you wouldn't get something wrong with. Okay, I'm just, you know what I'm talking about. You, like, you just open that engine, look at all the light, there, there's going to be something wrong. But if you get around me for 24 hours, you're going to find fault. I'm going to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. Would you agree? Yeah. But so are you. <coughs> That's why we have to, the fruit of the Spirit it involves being long-suffering with each other. Even when Curtis gives me a hard time playing soccer, I have to be long-suffering with him, so I'll just go and score two or three goals just to <laughs> tell him I love him, okay? I'm just joking, guys, because this is obviously is a big subject. Okay. The sad reality is, okay, so there's no reasoning. Okay, so let me go back. They tend to harbor a deep, unwavering bitterness against male authority. There's no reasoning with this spirit. The sad reality is they've chosen the role of victim over that of overcomer. What they miss is, Revelation makes it clear that it is only those who overcome that make it to heaven. But guys, that mightn't fit in with your theology. But I'm telling you, that's what the book says. He that overcometh, 
shall eat of the tree, shall overcome the second, shall be overcome the second death, whatever. You look at the seven things that are overcome. Christians are overcomers. We are not victims. You and me are victors. If you're a victim here tonight, then you're either not saved or else you're badly backslidden. Guys, I'm telling you, you're either in a bad place. You, that is not God's order. God's order for you is not that you're a victim. You all went quiet on me. Do you disagree with that? Are we victims or are we victors? The Bible says we are not that we are conquerors. We are more than conquerors. And the Lord says that he would bring nothing across your path that you would not be able to deal with or he would give you a way of escape. What you're going through at the moment, Jesse and Josie, there's no way God would have let you have to deal with that unless he knew that you would be able to come through this. There's no way he's punishing you. There's no way that he is is trying to humiliate you. I believe that, I don't know how I could have dealt with it, but I'm just telling you that our God is not punishing his children. It's the devil that wants to punish us. There's a devil that wants to do damage and hurt and destruction and division to all of us and all of our families and all of our marriages. Be aware of that. So, Ron, would you read these scriptures? Uh, just read the first one, please. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 23, 25, If thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there remembers that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Go and talk to ten people on the phone and vomit up your guts to them. If you know that your brother has an issue with you, how do you deal with it? And what do you do here? Reconcile. By the way, God has given every single person in this house the ministry of reconciliation. What is reconciliation? If you come into this service tonight and heard that Ron and me had been, we got, we got reconciled today, what would you think? If, I, if you heard, hey, Paul and Ron just got reconciled today, what, what's the first thing you would think? Oh, huh? Really messed up. <laughs> the first thing you would think is what happened. Right or wrong? Oh, really messed up. <laughs> it's all if you heard, seriously, if you heard Ron and me had just got reconciled today, would you not think that what happened to them? Huh? Did Ron hit Paul or did Paul hit Ron? Okay. But I'm telling you, what I'm saying is reconciliation is where, where, where people who have got issues with each other. Sort it out. They get on the, the same page. Okay, Ron, would you read the, the next passage? James three fourteen through 16 declares, If ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish, for where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Do you see that? First of all, where there's division and there is no effort to sort out that division, the Bible says it's devilish. That word devilish in, in the King James actually means demon-like. It's demonic. That's the way demons get on. It's demonic. Can you see there... Th- the result where there's envy and where there's strife, division, what does it result in here? Confusion and every evil work. Is the Lord the author of confusion? What is he the author of? Peace. Oh. Okay. No, no. You're okay. 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 The Bible says the Lord is not the author of confusion, but of peace. God wants peace in your life. He wants peace in your marriage, in your family. He wants peace in this church because he's the Prince of Peace. Where Christ is reigning, a lot of this is 101 Christianity, guys. Would you agree? This is 101. Like, this is basics. Like, if I've got an issue with Curtis, 
I have to talk to him. And he knows over the years that, and it's the same with him, if we've got an issue, we go to each other and we talk it out. And I know when I leave him that my friendship is not going to be affected by that. But why? Because I know he forgives. And even if we disagree, which we will at times, I still love him. I still, he's still my friend. He's still my brother. And I'm still going to watch his back for him. I, one thing I know is, if I was on a battle on Walt Hill, Curtis is one of those guys I would want beside me. This church is full of people I would want beside me. Because they're loyal people. They're faithful. And guess what Jesus is called in Revelation? True and faithful. Everything about him is faithful. We should be faithful to each other. We should be faithful to our spouses. We should be faithful in our friendships. Um, we should be faithful even with those we work for. Even with our bosses. They should look upon us and go, you're faithful, you're faithful. Now, that doesn't mean, Peter, you have to stay there for 300 years in that job. Okay, I'm not talking about that. But I'm saying he needs to see something in your character and say, he's a faithful man. Are you with me on that? Okay, so... Would you read the, the last verse there, please? <coughs> Jesus warns in Matthew 6.15, If ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive ye your trespasses. Guys, that is probably, I don't know about you, every time I read that, it sobers me up. Anybody else feel the same? Like that, That's one reason I can't hold a grudge. You know, if, if Peter offends me and all, I, I, well, first of all, I can't take communion or preach until I, at least I've tried to sort out with Peter. I'm just telling you because, now, I'm telling you that a lot of the times I sort stuff out with people and then a week later I realize they didn't sort it out. But I'm free. I can preach, I can whatever. And Pastor McConnell dealt with somebody who had really trashed him for years, really bad. And he, he felt convicted after many years. And he, he come up to Pastor McConnell and says, Pastor McConnell, he says, I'm here to bury the hatchet. <laughs> Pastor McConnell says, great. He says, make sure that the handle's buried as well. <laughs> That's what he said to him. He says, make sure the handle's buried. Why did he say that? <laughs> Why? He's a pastor. He had dealt with that for years. People say, oh, I forgive you, Ron. I'm sorry. Did you were reconciled. And then, no, so, oh, sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. No, but seriously, I'm telling you, if, you, if I say sorry, I'm, I, listen, I, I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. I'm wrong. He should, he should take that because he wants to be forgiven. Are you with me on this? Yeah. That, that's one of the most sober and passages in Scripture. That's why you should not harbor grudges or bitterness, or resentment. There's, oh, that's all the scripture you need between now and Judgment Day. That there should get rid of all your resentment and should cause you to run and get something sorted out like that there. Do any of you remember the story of the man who was forgiven 10,000 talents in the Bible? And then he was owed 100 pence, which is like $1.30. What did he do to that guy who offended him? him. Threw him in prison. Threw, threw the key away. Yeah. Do you know what the Lord said about that? Go ahead, Ron. Matthew 18, 32. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desiredest me. Shouldst not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Okay, Curtis, what's the thinking behind, what's the message behind this? What's, what's, who's this talking about? Well, who is? Who? This, guys, this is telling our story here. Would you agree we're, we're the one who he's forgiven? Huh? How much are you forgiven tonight? 
How much do you appreciate His forgiveness? Not enough. If you appreciate His forgiveness, how dare you harbor anything against your brother? That's what it's saying. On Judgment Day, they're the ones away from me. I never knew you. Why? Because a Christian forgives. If you're holding bitterness, malice in your heart tonight, then I'm telling you there's something wrong. You are either miserable in your Christian walk and absolutely defeated, powerless, your prayers are bouncing off that roof, or you're not saved. I'm sorry. I'm sorry you're not saved, or else you're, you're badly, badly backslidden. Okay, so what's the answer? Okay, I, w- I want to <coughs> just cover a few things. Instead of love, this spirit produces bitterness. Instead of unity, this spirit produces division. Instead of forgiveness, this spirit produces resentment. Instead of reconciliation, this spirit produces separation. Instead of mercy, this spirit hypocritically cries for justice. So this spirit wants grace for themselves, but justice for you. What would happen if God gave you justice, Peter? What would happen to any of you if God gave you justice? Be honest. Does God give you justice or does he give you grace? Justice is giving you what you deserve. Grace is giving you what you don't deserve. That's the way you should be. That's the way I should be. So the answer. Those who are oppressed by this spirit have a choice. Align with God's blueprint and scripture or be used as to a tool of the devil to divide and destroy. It's that simple. The answer comes when a person takes their eyes off the faults of others. They look in the mirror and they take ownership of their own wrongs and the damage that they're doing. This takes strength, honesty and humility, but it produces repentance. Guys, this is what God is trying to ensure. If anybody has ought in this church over this last 27 months, this is what they need to do. To repent means to admit your wrong and turn from it. The enemy could be stripped of his power right now if those involved would simply repent, forgive, reconcile, and be healed. This brings instant freedom. This brings immediate deliverance from the influence of this demon. There's a demon behind this, guys. There's a very, very, very strong demon behind this that I would say is a a territorial principality. And I, you've never, ever heard me say that before. Because, guys, it's way... I'm t- I've never dealt with something as strong. Think about it. We're about to move into a new building. Do you think it's strange that we're getting hit right now? Look at the timing. Look at the ferocity of it. L- listen, it's the first time where a pastor can't re. I can't even reason with people. Like, it's like, please, what you're doing is wrong. We need to... No. That's... Like Once it gets to that stage, it's, all you can do is really step back and say, Lord, help. By the way, it's the same with you. If you try to reason with somebody and they won't reason, there's not a lot you can do. Okay. Proverbs 28. Do you want to read Proverbs 28? Bro? <coughs> Proverbs 28, 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Okay. For the rest of us, okay? The conversations you have, maybe I've got up here. The conversations you have and who you align with will have serious spiritual implications for you moving forward. Now, please be aware of this. You either choose right or wrong. It's that simple. Ron, would you read Exodus 32 here? Exodus 32, 26. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. Brother, sister, you have a choice and I've got a choice at this time. We're either going to let the devil divide us and destroy, or we're going to go, not on my watch, devil. Not on my watch. 
I'm not going to put my ear to that nonsense. Division is from the pit of hell. It's not the heart of God. I'm not going to listen it. I'm not even going to... Listen, people in this church have listened too much to this nonsense. The people listening are as bad as the people speaking. Because you're giving oxygen to that evil. You're saying, come on, devil, come in here, have a seat. I'm going to listen to you. No, you give the devil a rubber ear. You say, no. I love Peter. I love Les. I love Tanner. I'm, the devil is not going to come and tell me how wicked they are. You choose who's on the Lord's side. If we align with God, this demon or these demons are going to be destroyed. We must first resist the lies of the enemy, then confront them with the truth of God, which we're doing tonight. Then let God work. You choose whether you want to listen, submit, and support this demonic attack, or whether you want to fight it in the power of the Spirit of God. We will either allow this Spirit to continue to do damage, or we will arise united and confront it in the name of Jesus Christ and overcome it. This is not about anybody's reputation apart from Him. This house is for His glory. Can you imagine the, glo- the joy in the camp of the wicked if they seen us divided and this thing fall to bits? How do you think the camp of the wicked is going to view that? Think about it. What, do you, what are our enemies going to say? What do they say when they see us divided where we won't even talk? What does that tell the enemy? Do you know what they say? And I've heard it before. Christians. Christian, don't talk to me about church. Don't talk to me about Christians. You, don't, don't come to me, tell me about the love of God and forgiveness and that whenever you can't even do it. Let me tell you, in Ireland, that's what they do. I've seen it, like where police officers say, they've called a guy out that you work with who, who won't, who's maybe a gossip. They say, you call yourself a Christian? If you were a Christian, you wouldn't be running your mouth off. Guys, I'm telling you how, seriously, let me tell you what it was like being a policeman in Northern Ireland. I remember the sergeant. They, they, they used to do this, like every night the sergeant would let, okay, in night duty, they would let like two guys go early at three o'clock in the morning. Okay? Out of like 14 guys, they would let two guys go and the sergeant would say, hey, Les, you, you two can go. Uh, we'll, we'll cover. I did it once, okay? Maybe I did it more than once, but I, can, I know of once. I did it. Sergeant says, Paul, go on. You and James can go. So I went home. Guess what happened the next day when I was among some of the guys? What, what do you think they said to me? Be honest. Think. What did they say? Paul, I thought you were a Christian. Are you going to claim eight hours pay? I dropped my I dropped my head, and I says, guys, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I says, I'm sorry, I'll not do that again. And I says, I can't I can't argue with what you're doing. I was going to claim eight hours pay. I'm being honest, guys. I'm being honest before you, because you know what? God knows anyway. Okay. So I was going to claim those I was going to claim those eight hours because that's what everybody did. So I went to the sergeant and I said, Sergeant, I'll just be claiming four hours. I'll take four hours in lieu of it. Why? Because the testimony of Christ was more important to me than those four hours were to me. Anyway, I knew God would give me that, that back. I knew he would, he would look after me. Financially, I wouldn't lose one cent or one penny in, in Northern Ireland terms. I don't even know why I'm sharing a lot of this stuff tonight, but I know God's speaking. Okay? So just stick with me a few more moments. You have to ask yourself simple questions. Is this bitterness, strife, division, unforgiveness, disorder, refusal to reconcile, undermining of authority of God, or is it of the enemy? I'm not talking about for a few months. I'm talking about... 27 months. 
I don't share with you, I don't even share with the leaders everything I deal with because I do try to deal with a lot of stuff one-on-one -on -one because, do you know what? I would prefer to get it sorted out and nobody know about it. I'm just being honest. If I, there's stuff I can't sort out, I go to Kyle, the other elder. There's two elders in this church. I go to Kyle and we'll talk through the stuff. I'll say, Kyle, what do you think here? If Kyle and me can't get a sword out, I typically just take it to the rest of the board. And most of you know, because I have talked to nearly everyone in this church one-on-one -on -one about something and said, you know, you need to be careful with that or don't do that or don't say that or whatever. But it doesn't go any further. It doesn't go to my wife. It doesn't go to the, doesn't even go to Kyle. It doesn't go to the leaders because I've sorted it out with the individual. And I have no desire to humiliate a person or just drag them through the dirt because I don't want to do that and I don't want God to do that to me. And by the way, just before you, you say, well, you, you've done this to me and you didn't do it. Yeah, I'm sure there's things I've did imperfectly. Yes, okay. I'm sure there's times I've been stressed out and maybe talked, talked harshly to somebody or whatever. And I get that. There's times as a pastor, I am stressed. Pastor Walt says, pastors operate in life in different levels of stress. If it's not here, it's here, here, here. I, I don't work at zero. Even when I go on vacation, I, I find it hard to wind it down to zero. And I remember Pastor Schutz said, um, he said, pastors never switch off. He says, whenever you were on duty and you'd got your earpiece on, and he said, you were talking to a motorist, he says, did you turn your radio off? I says, no. I says, I just turned it down. He says, exactly. Excuse me, sir, have you got your ID? But that, I was still in touch with bass. When I go on vacation, I, I don't switch my radio off. I, there's no button that switches off. It's like, um, it's like, even to this day, I go through a mile, and I'm trying to switch the police officer off on me. Like, it's like, and I'm like, that guy's a, a thief. And... Yeah. I know he's a thief. How do I know he's a thief? Because I've worked with thieves and I know how they look. I know how they function. But I'm, but I'm saying the pastor thing, so I just work at different levels of stress. But that's what pastors do. If, if you think I just go on vacation, the day that I head to Omaha Airport, I'm like, ah, oh, <laughs> great. It, I just, and I'm not saying I'm running about vitamin eels or worried, or, but I'm just saying... There's an intensity to ministry that a lot of people don't know, but talk to pastors and talk to Pastor John on Sunday and ask him how ministry looks like. Ask his wife. Whenever you sit up there in the house, you're having food and his wife's in tears most of the meal. Broken. Because what Christians have done to them. Beautiful woman of God. Little church of 40 people in Nebraska. left their, their own state to come to Nebraska to serve the Lord out of a job. Is that really Christian? So, Christians should always choose light, light over darkness, love over hate, unity over division, order over disorder. I'm coming to a close. So what do we do? Ephesians 4.27 tells us not to give place to the devil. This spirit must be resisted. We must firmly confront this demonic agenda. For you to put your ear to this voice is to give place to the devil. Make a choice to refuse to receive anything from anyone secretly slandering. Now listen to this. The leadership or trying to divide this body. Okay? Guys, this is, this is reasonable. This is what it is to be a Christian. If you take offense at this, there's something wrong with you spiritually. <coughs> By the way, Revelation 12, 11 says, And they overcome him, the devil, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto death. Pray for the exposure and destruction of this demon or demons, power or powers, principality or principalities. Brother, sister, we're going to pray tonight. I know I've taken a lot of time, but I've had to cover this. We are ultimately fighting a demon here. 
we are either going to let that demon go and do whatever you want, or we're going to say no. We are going to lock arms tonight and say, go to hell, devil. Get out of this church. Get out of my head. Get out of my family. Get out of this town. Because Walt Hill is going to see a move of God. Pat, the Omaha Reservation is going to see a move of God. I believe this is the devil's last throw before revival. This is the big hit. Pastor McConnell predicted there was going to be an onslaught before we moved in there. He gave me a lot of detail about it, and another pastor gave me even more detail about it, which I haven't shared with you. But I'm telling you, the tactic is coming into play. Everything is because this is how the devil works. But be sure the devil is going to be defeated here. Whether you go into that new building or whether you go in to the promised land, it's up to you. But I'm telling you, by the grace of God, I want everyone to go in. Every one of us. Every one of us, whether they're hurting at the moment or whether they're here or they're not here, I want every one of us to go in together. But we have to go God's way, which is the path of humility. So this is my last slide. So just bear with this last slide. This church is officially on a war footing. Anybody ready to fight in here? Put your hand up if you're ready to fight. Okay. This church is officially on a war footing. This is a call to arms. It is time to get real. It's time to fight. This is a real battle. This is a vicious attack designed to obliterate the testimony of this church and obliterate all of us. Where there's going to be debris everywhere. There's going to be children that won't be at the children's thing. There's going to be youth that's hurting. There's going to be tweenies that's hurting. It's going to, listen, if one person starts to act up, it affects everybody around them. And Pastor McConnell always said this, throw a stone into a pond. The ripples go to the side. Have you ever seen that? You throw a stone into the pond. So what, that stone hits the pond, but the ripples go to the side. Basically, it affects a lot of people. The reason why I'm been open tonight is because I know everybody's feeling it. They know something's going on. They feel a darkness. They feel an oppression. And I'm telling you, I can't keep quiet anymore. Why? Because I love you, but most importantly, I love the Lord. I love the little lambs. I said to somebody recently, and, and some of you maybe were there when I said it, if you want to know my vulnerable point, if you want to know my weakness, do you know what it is? When people hit the lambs and hit the sheep. That's my vulnerable point. When you're getting hit. Because when you get hit, I feel it. I feel it. When people's getting hurt in here, I feel it. When Jesse and Josie got hit, I was broken hearted. I'm still broken hearted. I can't shake that off. I, I know it will eventually lift. But we're broken hearted tonight. This church is going through a time of mourning. We should be locking arms. Locking arms around this couple. Locking arms around each other. People should be locking the arms around the pastor. And yet, at a time when we should be at maximum unity, there's people in the background that are sticking the knife in me and in others. It's painful because I'm vulnerable at the moment. I have sat in that house with Jesse and Josie not even knowing what to say as a pastor. Sometimes all I could do is hug them. It's the most painful thing that I've ever experienced. I told you, I told you way before this that I felt going through, I was going to go through bereavement more than anything I've ever been before. And then I find myself having to deal with this and it's like, this is so painful. It is so painful. It's unbelievable. And I would wake up the next morning, like at three in the morning, I couldn't sleep. And it's like, is this real? So here's, here's I believe, a blueprint here. And oh, this is my last slide. Recognize that God is on our side. Amen? Amen? He wants us to join him in fighting this demonic attack. And I'm talking about a demon here. Not human beings. There is demon, a strong, strong demon or demons that are moving in. 
He wants us to join him in fighting this demonic attack. We need to get close to him and trust him to sort this out. Number two, we must fight Satan with the truth of God. Your feelings, opinions, friendships, or family relationships are not what defines what is right and wrong. By the way, I've disagreed with my mother at times when she was manipulating my brother to get to church. I told her, I see my mom manipulating. When my brother came to church, she had all these people working on him. And I says, Mom, that's manipulation. Guess what? My brother never come back to church. I'm just telling you that I can't say this unless I've walked as walk. Okay? I was dealing with a situation back when this church was at its foundation. Okay? And there was family involved. And the family were against me. I said to Pastor Terry, I says, Terry, I says, blood is thicker than water. And he rebuked me. He says, truth is thicker than blood. Guys, you know what I'm talking about. Your loyalty to him goes beyond your loyalty to your spouse, to your children. Your loyalty to him goes beyond anything in this world. Let God be true. Every man a liar. Recognize the power and protection of the blood of Jesus Christ. Satan can only go so far and then he must stop. Amen, Ron? Amen, Amen congregation? Amen. Resist and bind this spirit or these spirits. Resist or bind it. We have authority. What we bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Resist the devil and he shall what? If someone is blinded by the lies of this demon or demons, we need to pray that their eyes would be open, their ears would hear God's voice, their hearts would be softened, and that they would see their need of repentance and would consequently be reconciled. Is that unreasonable? Is that really, is that agenda that we need to implement, is that biblical or is it biblical? Guys, I'll tell you, I have never, as a police officer, writing books and spiritual warfare and dealing with secret, I've never dealt with anything as strong as this. I know time has beat us tonight, but I would like us to take maybe 20 minutes here as a congregation to stand up and pray and fight. Now, I want to say this. If you've had enough of this demonic attack and you're willing to lock arms tonight, would you stand right now? You want to stand on the Lord's side. You want to lock arms with your brothers and sisters and you're ready for warfare tonight because you know that God's on your side. Just stand tonight. <coughs> would you lift your hands to heaven tonight? Would you just start to praise and thank the Lord for who he is? Just exalt the Lord tonight. Glorify him. Exalt him for he's king of kings. He's Lord of Lords. He's sovereign tonight. Come on, open your mouth. Exalt the Lord tonight. Listen, this is a battle tonight. Open your mouth. Don't be dumb tonight. Just tell Jesus what you think about him tonight. He is on our side tonight. Let's fight through the darkness tonight. The devil cannot stop us when we praise our God tonight. I can tell you, nobody can come in between you and God tonight. When you start to focus on Him tonight, you start to see, get your eyes off all the problems. You start to get your eyes off the devil. You start to see that He is majestic. He's sovereign tonight. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. Oh, hallelujah, Lord. We glorify you tonight, Lord. We lift up your name tonight, Lord. Lord, we thank you that we are on the Lord's side. Oh, we exalt you tonight. We praise you tonight. Oh, God, we believe, Lord, that you are going to deal with this demon, Lord. Lord, we believe that you're going to snuff this demon out tonight, Lord. We believe that your power is stronger than anything that could attack us, attack our families, oh God, attack this church, oh God. Lord, whether there's 10 billion uh, demonic powers out there that's against us, you can snuff them out tonight, Lord. Oh, Lord, there's nothing, oh God, can stop you, Lord. Lord, we are a family. We love each other. We need each other, oh God. Lord, I thank you, O oh God. Oh, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world, O oh God. Lord, we ask that your power would fall tonight. Let the power of the Holy Ghost fall upon us, Lord. Oh, Lord, just come tonight. 
quicken us, Lord. Stir us up. Strengthen us, O God. Heal our hearts, O God. Oh, Lord, tonight, Lord, you are a mighty God. You are a faithful God, Lord. You are a worthy God, Lord. Oh, we just lift you up tonight, Lord. Oh, have thine own way in this house, Lord. Oh, Lord. You said resist the devil and he will flee from us. He will vanish. He will disappear. Oh, Lord, we lock arms tonight. Oh, mighty God, mighty God, mighty God. Mighty God, mighty God, mighty God. God. Oh, Lord, you're a God of love, grace, mercy. You're a God of forgiveness. You're a God of reconciliation, oh God. Oh, Lord, that you live within us tonight. Lord, who can we go to but to the Lord? Oh, Lord, we worship you. Praise your name, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Lord. We magnify you, Lord. Oh, God. We need your help tonight, Lord. We need your intervention tonight, Lord. Lord, we pray for those that are hurting, oh God. Lord, those that are even been taken out of the battle, Lord, would you even speak to them tonight? Wherever they are, whatever they're doing, oh God, Lord, would you minister unto them, Lord? Lord, that they would see, Lord, Lord, the foolishness of bitterness, Lord, and Lord, the foolishness, Lord, of division, oh God, and destruction, Lord, and see, Lord, where they belong is here, Lord, in the presence of God. Oh Lord, just move, oh God, by thy spirit. Oh, move by thy spirit, oh God. Oh, mighty God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Lord. We glorify you tonight, Lord. If anybody wants to pray tonight, just pray. As we just agree here tonight. Oh, mighty God. Oh, magnify you. Lord, should we even die in the battle, Lord? We're not going to bow down to the devil. Oh, Lord. As Shadrach, Meshach, oh, God. We just glorify you. Oh, we worship you, Lord. We glorify you. Yes, oh, God. Oh, mighty God, mighty God, mighty God. We are moving forward with you, Jesus. Oh, wonderful Lord, wonderful Jesus. Jesus. Give us oh, the armor mighty of God. God. Oh. You did not give us armor from the back, Lord, because mm. a Christian goes forward. Mm. Thank you, God. Anyone else? Just one, one after the other here. I know time is kind of shot tonight, but... Anyone else just want to thank him tonight? Just I want to lift up those who are hurting. Oh, yeah. I want to lift up those who really, really believe they are right. But have been deceived. Oh, Lord, not that this condemnation from within us. Hmm. But there is love from within us. Hmm. Mm. Oh, mighty God. Yes, Lord, oh God. And Lord, that through our prayers, through our love, not through our thumping and mm. putting down, but through our love and our caring, mm. Lord, that they can recognize the deception mm. that they have fallen under. Mm. And it seems so right to oh, them. It God. seems so real to them. Lord, it's almost impossible. Oh, yes, Lord. Amen. And by the way, for the record, I, I have my notes word for word. If anybody wants my notes tonight, I can email them to you. So drop me a text or an email, and I'll email my notes to you.